Holy Love Lutheran Church. Today, across the ELCA, we celebrate something called God's Work, Our Hands. It's the acknowledgement that we are the Church of Christ. We are the present embodiment of God's love here on this planet. And so our actions ought to reflect that. Join us in worship as we reflect on both our actions and how we can be better bearers of God's image. We continue in worship with our confession and assurance of God's forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives us all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Pray with me. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have honored you with our lips, but have harmed our neighbors with our tongues. The cravings at war within us cause conflicts and disputes. It is our, in our desire to be first, we make distinctions among ourselves. We place the needs of the poor and the suffering last. In your great mercy, forgive us our sins. Draw us near with grace in time of need, and turn us to follow in the way of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Beloved, God promises to forgive our iniquity and remember our sin no more. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of eternal healing, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Come, live in the light, shine with the joy and the love of the Lord. We are called to be light for the kingdom, to live in the freedom of the city of God. We are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. We are called to serve one another. To walk humbly with God. Sing, sing a new song. That great day when all will be one God will reign and will walk with each other as sisters and brothers unleighted in love. We are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. We are called serve one another, to walk humbly with God. Let us profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. A reading from James, 
the second chapter, verses 1 through 10 and 14 through 17. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there, or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blasphemy the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as, as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Let none be forgotten throughout the world. In the triune name of God, go and baptize. Listen, listen, God is calling. Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by the way of Sidon down towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephetha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, but the, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more they zealously proclaimed it. 
They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Fyodor Dostoevsky, the famous Russian novelist responsible for crime and punishment and the brothers Karamazov, said there are only two stories in all of literature. A man goes on a journey, or a stranger comes to town. What's weird to me, though, is that it's the same story. It just depends on what narrative point the story is being told from. In the Gospel reading for today, we get again what seems like two unrelated stories. The first, which we'll unpack in a moment, takes place in some unnamed person's house in Tyre. And the second is in the region of the Decapolis, a group of 10 cities that formed a cultural area. Think about America's New England or America's Midwest. It's that kind of thing, a region with a specific culture. Both Tyre and the Decapolis are not good Jewish cities. This isn't where Jerusalem, Bethlehem, or even Bethel is located. These regions weren't part of the traditional Jewish regions. They were never part of the Promised Land. And in Jesus' time, they were secularly ruled and they were under secular power. That's not to say that there isn't a Jewish population in those places. There was, and in the Decapolis region specifically, there was a large population of Jews. But the Jews there were viewed as outsiders. They were immigrants. The Decapolis region wasn't for the Jewish people. So when Jesus, as a Jewish person, and his Jewish disciples go to Tyre and then back through the Decapolis region, it's the story of a stranger coming to town, twice. Or it's the story of a man going on an adventure, if we keep Jesus as the main character. But starting with the miracle at Tyre, Jesus wants to fly under the radar. This follows just after last week's reading, when the Jewish religious elite were watching him and his friends like a hawk, eagle-eyed, ready to pick out anything they did wrong. Okay, fine, Jesus says, if my own people don't accept me, I'll leave. I'll go somewhere different. That makes sense. So they leave the Jewish power centers and go to this foreign region in an unnamed person house. We get it, they don't want to be bothered. But word got out because a stranger came to town. And what's more, this is a famous prophet stranger. And yet, instead of the entire town beating down the door of the house, there's just one person, a woman, a non-Jewish foreign woman from Syria, Phoenicia, the Syro-Phoenician region. She enters this house and she immediately bows at Jesus' feet in a sign of obedience, respect, and request. Heal my daughter, this woman who went on a journey says. Jesus, the stranger who came to town replies, the children need to be fed first, then the dogs can eat. And yeah, this is as bad as you think it is. In the messages translation of this quote, they record Jesus as saying, stand in line and take your turn. The children get fed first. If there's any left over, the dogs get it. The children are in reference to the Jewish people. So Jesus, a Jew in a foreign town as a foreigner, refers to this equally foreign woman as a dog. It's a slur. Finish this quote with me. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. This is from John 1. The word is Jesus, God's word. That is God's communication, God's conversation with all of humanity and all of creation became flesh. That is who Jesus is. Jesus is one with God, the embodiment of God's opinions. Words always accompany action. We see this throughout the Old Testament especially, but God's big beef with humanity is that we'll say one thing with our lips and do another thing with our actions. Oh yeah, in the Old Testament they'll say, we trust God, we totally trust God. And then they'll sacrifice to an idol as a safety measure. Oh sure, we're devoted to God. And then they'll neglect to actually do any of the things God says to do. In our modern world, we may not go through the ritual of sacrifice, but we do this same lip service and lack of action. Words matter. For this story, where Jesus calls woman a, this woman a dog, for it to be written down and included in our historic gospel accounts of Jesus' life, miracle, and resurrection is critical. 
because Jesus here comes across as a jerk. It's one of the hardest stories in the Bible. How do we wed this with the knowledge that God is all loving and Jesus, God in the flesh, cares for everyone, that no one is preferred by God's family? This story begs the question, then does God only care for ethnically Jewish people? <laughs> because if so, I'm totally screwed. I'm Eastern European in origin. The answer is no. Jesus, this foreigner in a foreign town, they're entitled to escape the Jewish norms, and this woman comes to ask the stranger for help, but it's the combination of Dostoevsky's two literary stories merging. It comes to a head with Jesus' dismissive statement. The stranger came to town, the stranger went on a journey in the first place. Which one wins? The woman's reply is instantaneous. Again, using the message's translation, she says, well, of course, master, but don't dogs under the table get scraps dropped by the children? She acknowledges Jesus's position, using master here or sir in the translation I read earlier, and she points that wherever people have drawn boundaries, God has included the others. Sure, okay, dogs are under the table, but they still got all the goods that the kids got, didn't they? In Jesus' lineage, there are a multitude of outsiders, and they get named specifically as being the forebearers of Christ. We know of Ruth, King David's great-great-grandmother, who was a Moabite outsider. Rahab, who was a woman who made her living as a sex worker, is in, is in Jesus' lineage. She is part of the life that Christ has come to bear. For the Messiah, the Christ, to have these non-Jewish family members, these scandalous family members, proves that this insider-outsider language, this children-dog language, has been a false boundary. Because who is God's people? Everyone. You, me, your bestie, your kids, your grandkids. And also, the guy that cut you off in traffic this morning. The grocery store clerk who's rude. And yeah, that politician. Everyone is loved, created, and redeemed by God. To prove that point, we follow up with this next story, another healing set in yet another foreign region. In the Decapolis, there's this man who can't hear, who's been deaf all his life, and he's brought to Jesus. Of course, because he can't hear, he has a hard-to-understand language. Your speech is so dependent on your ability to hear. So this person who has never heard whose own communication attempts are muddled, is brought to the word of God made flesh. Jesus gives a command, ephetha. This word is an Aramaic. Aramaic is the language of the people of the time period. Aramaic is the lingua franca. It's not Hebrew, the language of only the Jewish people. It's not Greek, the language of only the non-Jewish people. It's the language that everyone would have known and spoken in. Jesus isn't talking to the cool, hip lingo or that elite, educated people. He's talking in the everyday language of the region. All regions of the people, the Jewish and the Romans, be opened. It's said clearly to the supposed insiders of God's grace and the outsiders, the Gentiles, the Syrophoenician women, they're insiders now. Be opened, realize the fullness that God's love is for everyone. Once this has happened, the man speaks plainly, and the whole crowd is astonished and speak further of the miracles Christ has done. So it's not a matter of which of the two stories you are, the one accepting the stranger in the town or the one leaving home to be the stranger in a new town. Because you are part of God's grand story, God's grand family, and you are opened to the possibilities of God working in this world. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. God's work, our hands working together, building a future, repairing the world, raising up homes, planting new gardens, feeding the hungry and sheltering the cold. Bless God our hands as we work in your name, sharing the good news of your gospel. 
we come before our Lord together in prayer. Holy Spirit, you fill the world with grace and say to us, now you do this too. Lead us to add love and mercy where we can. Grant peace to our neighborhoods and peace to our hearts. Jesus the Christ, you emptied yourself in an act of love and said, now you do this too. Lead us to pour out abundantly for our neighbors and ourselves. We ask specifically for those we name in our hearts before you. Surround each with your presence. Creator God, you said, I created you in my image. Make sure everything you do looks like me. Lead us to give generously, not only because of the world's needs, but because we are called to be generous, to be graceful, to be in the image of God. Lead us in your generosity of spirit and love. Be with our students and staff of our preschool and kindergarten. Teach us your ways. We are called to put your grace in action. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Please share a sign of peace. There is a saying, may you live in interesting times. At first glance, this sounds like an ironic curse. Interesting, what? A pandemic? War in Gaza and Ukraine? Famines in Sudan and Ethiopia? Stress in our families, our communities, and even in our congregations? Who needs interesting? Give us boring. Give us garden variety. Give us the same old, same old. But what if may you live in interesting times is not a curse, but a call? Yes, we live with danger and uncertainty, but as people of the resurrection, we also live in hope and have felt God's love, which sustains us even in the most difficult times. God's love, most clearly expressed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, is always real. Some of life's hard realities may make it difficult to perceive. Maybe we are trying too hard Maybe we think that only monumental occasions and dramatic feelings are manifestations of God's love. People come to our congregations because they want to share and feel God's love in community. They want to know that they are not alone, that they are forgiven, that God's love gives us the grace and space to try and fail, to sin boldly, as Martin Luther says. And we, as broken as we are, as dulled as we might have become to the reality of God's love, have not been cursed with interesting times, but are called to serve as ambassadors of God's love. We see God's love in the sacraments, where God claims each of us with God's love and nourishes and strengthens us with Jesus' own body and blood. We see God's love when we pray because we can enter into the sacred space of God's love in joy, in sorrow, in hope, in times of desperation, because God's love is real and God receives our prayers even when we feel we can't pray. We see God's love in forgiveness when hearts and lives are mended and hurt and alienation are taken away. We see God's love in acts of service when we, liberated by God's grace, reach out to our neighbor. And we experience the life-changing love of God in scripture, in worship, in music, dance, and art. Yes, we live in interesting times, but these interesting times are made meaningful and filled with possibility and hope because God's love is real. Go in peace and share God's love with one another in all creation. Thanks be to God.
Thank you for being part of Holy Love Lutheran Church and worshiping with us today. We invite you to continue to support our ministries and to keep us vital as we seek to live out God's love in the world. You can go to our website or click the QR code with your smartphone. We also invite you to give of your time and your talents. Consider being part of our online worship service for a reader or a singer. We invite you to be part of our community in person as well. However you are able to give, we thank you. Let us pray. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts towards those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care, and prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of the star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church here on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat, all of you. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper was over, again he took the cup and gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Beloved of God, for as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, then forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. This is the body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. All are welcome at Christ's table. Will you let me be your servant? Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. We are here 
to help each other walk the mile and bear the load. Receive the benediction. May God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever to go forth boldly into the world to which you have been called. Amen.